Hi guys, just out here drying my hair up. I always think it's a good time to have a chat because uh, not much you can do when you're drying your hair, eh? And the sun is actually out, so I'll be out there in a minute. But I've got my cup of tea here, Dad's cup, you know, cup, cup I bought from a dear old dad. Tea always tastes better in that. Yeah, anyway, um, I've got something really, really, really important that I wanted to talk to you about today. And um, it's the nature of karmic relationships, right? Very, very important topic. But anyway, look, just before I get into that, it sort of links in a way, but I wanted to talk to you about a family, a family story. Going back, oh, a number of years now, right? I would have only been about maybe 39, I think, just before I turned 40, I think. Anyway, in our family, like, we used to sort of, like, share animals, like, you know, somebody had a litter of pups, you know, well, you'd give them around the family, the pups, you know. Well, anyway, what happened was, Grant, that's uh, my brother, he's born the, the same year as, um, as Putin, 1952, except he's an Aryan, you know. But anyway, um, Grant's next door neighbour had this litter of pups, right? And um, the mother of the pups uh, was a pig dog, a black and white pig dog, right? And she was a purebred. She, they used to show at the show every year, right? The Royal Easter Show. Well, anyway, somehow or other, when she came into season, either she jumped the fence or somebody jumped the fence, some, you know, mongrel around the place jumped the fence, right? So they ended up with this litter of pups, see, they didn't want them, they weren't any, worth anything to them, as far as they were concerned, because, you know, they couldn't sell them, they weren't purebreds, you know, didn't even know what breed they were, see, so, anyway, Grant said, don't worry about it, mate, he said to his neighbour, uh, he said, um, I'll take three, and I'll get three off your hands, he's, anyway, so he took one, he called her Jermaine, after Jermaine Greer, <laughs> more would you, and... <laughs> I was a real fan of hers until the day she said, what's this bloody bullshit about bringing up the kids? She said, they'll come up anyway. I thought, yeah, right, yeah, okay. Anyway, so going along and moving along rather smartly here. Now look, I ended up with Tina. She was a black and white one. She looked a lot like the mother, right? She was a beautiful little dog, very pretty. Uh, but she had a few problems, but anyway, we won't go. I'll tell you about them in a minute. But anyway, and my brother Greg, he got Patch, Patchy, he used to call her. She was very similar to my Tina, black and white, just like a pig dog. Um, but not as pretty. Tina was very pretty, and I was lucky I got the best one, you know. But I reckon the boys said, I'll oh, give it to Pamela because she's a girl, right? And they took the ugly ones for themselves. <laughs> but anyway, I was a bit fortunate there, but. I wasn't quite so fortunate as it turned out because she turned out to be a motorbike chaser. Anyway, eventually she had a pup of her own, right? Well, I gave all the other pups away, but I kept one pup, and that was Rossi. He was named after Rossi Motorbike Boots, right? R-O-S-S-I, because he used to sleep in my son's Rossi Motorbike Boots, and his only little puppy about this big, you know. Anyway, actually... He used to sleep in the bed with us, you know, the king-size bed with us, with me and the three boys and Rossi. Anyway, when he first started sleeping in there, he was only this long, right? But then he got bigger and bigger and he's, he, he, he's nothing like a pig dog. Right? He's, his legs started to grow and they were about that long, you know, and he'd get into bed at night and he'd go... And he'd push the kid who was next to him, over, and eventually Daniel, my my middle son, fell out of bed one night because Rossi was doing this business, you know, pushing him over. Anyway, look, I'm getting off the track here. Um, going back to going back to telling you about Tina, as I said, she was a motorbike chaser, and Rossi, he was the fastest runner you've ever known in your life like you know anyway there used to be this young bloke come used to come down the street right on his motorbike he was a parsley picker down at the um down the farm down the road there see and he'd come past every morning anyway one day he said he pulled up and he said you know what he said 
I clocked your dog, that black one, he said, which was Rossi, he said, I clocked your dog yesterday and he did 30 k's an hour. He said, you could make money out of him. And I said, well, he's not a greyhound. I can't, I can't enter him in the races, you know. I mean, <laughs> bad luck, eh? <laughs> Nothing I can do about it. I mean, he had the potential. I mean, he could run. But, I mean, you, you can't just turn up with some uncle dog and enter him in with the greyhounds, can you? But anyway, so I never ever made any money out of him, but, I mean, the potential was there. Anyway, so I'm getting a bit off the track here again now. Where were I, what was I talking about now? Um, oh, yeah, anyway, I was talking about, oh, that's right, yeah, that's right, Greg, Greg, my brother that got patchy, patch. Anyway, Greg's a bit tough, you know. He's into this zero tolerance stuff you know tough love that kind of thing you know anyway he took patchy home you know he didn't have her very long and he decided you know she was adult so he'd have to teach her not to take baits from over the fence he reckoned that there were baiters in the area so he devised this plan which i was absolutely scandalous disgusted when i heard what he did anyway so what he did to patchy he went out the front with this big T-bone steak, right? But before he went out there with it, he smeared the top of it with mustard, right? Dropped it in the front yard and then went around the back. Of course, it wasn't long before Patchy's sniffing around the yard. <laughs> the gaze and the scent lights on the T-bone steak and she wolfs it down. and she tears around the side of the house to the water bowl. When she gets there, Greg's standing there. He's emptied the water bowl out, you see. And he looks at Patchy and he says, yeah, and Patchy goes, <laughs> he says, no, 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 you're not getting any water. You've got to learn not to take meat from the front yard, right? And he stood there looking at it and the poor bloody dog's eyes are rolling back in the head, you know, finally. He says, right, okay, you can have your water now. He said, from that day on, she never even went out the front yard, so she was never going to take a bait, was she? The front yard terrified her. She stayed out the back the whole time. Well, look, there you go. That I just wanted to tell you about that. Now, the reason that I wanted to tell you about that incident, because I think it segues into um, this next story nicely, kind of dovetails in, you see, because what a lot of people don't realise about karmic relationships they're actually designed for a purpose. Yeah, see, like, for instance, a bloke, you know, he might be having a bit of trouble sort of curbing his uh, urges, if you know what I mean. And uh, so, you know, the divine will always put a karmic um, in his way, like, you know. And uh, it's a bit like the steak with the mustard on it. See, it looks good, see? And he'll latch onto a quick smile, right? <laughs> then he finds it's covered in mustard, right? It's the worst thing he's ever involved himself in, right? And if he's lucky, if he's lucky, he'll come out of that relationship with it, you know, with at least a few bob in his pocket, but he, he might end up with nothing. He's liable to lose the house, the car, the kids, you know, and turn the kids against him and everything. And that's if they have kids, but, you know, often they do, right? And um, he'll be so bloody chastened, I can tell you, by the time he gets out of that relationship, he is never, never, as long as he lives, going to take a pick-up. <laughs> the pub home again no more one night stands for him he's learned his lesson right and it's exactly like exactly like the steak with the mustard on you see and as i said well the same thing can happen to a female too like you know if the, if the divine feminine if she doesn't um, smarten the ways and if she's a bit of a floozy same thing will happen to her you see 
and uh, but as I said, these divine masculines, you know, they can they like they can be like fallen angels. They can fall from grace, you see. So they have to be put back in their place. They have to be pick, you know. Eventually, they pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and start all over again, you know. But you know, it's quite a process, you see. Yeah. I just sort of wanted to tell you about that because, look, you know, a lot of people don't know about this sort of thing, you know. They've got no idea what's going out there in the real world, you know. They just think these things are just what happens to people, but no, no, they're not. You see, it's all about divine intervention. And once you start to realise that the divine intervened divinely, Life's never the same again. No, no, it's not. Never the same again. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I'll, uh, I've, got, I've got a song to record. So um, I've got to go and do that. And, uh, and I'll talk to you again another day. Okay, bye. Of course, I turn this thing off. Oh.